Hi, I'm Catherine Jean Lopez from the National Review Institute, and I'm so delighted to be joined by Father Peter John Cameron, who's a popular author and homilist and Dominican priest. Um, Father Peter John, thank you for for being here. Uh, we're recording this on Ash Wednesday. Thank you for everyone who's joining us live or who is uh, watching this after the fact. We're hoping this conversation is a conversation that can be helpful to people throughout Lent and even right to Holy Week. And um, one thing, Father Peter John, we were talking um, yesterday about is um, people can find Lent overwhelming, you know, oh no, this sense of dread that, you know, we have to sacrifice and, and repent and can find it overwhelming, particularly I've, I've seen a couple of mentions in, in the last couple of days about how can it be Lent again? Didn't we just start that with the churches closed? You know, we're in our, um, we've been going through this coronavirus cycle again and again and again. Um, but at the same time, I was, when I was praying morning prayer this morning, um, I just found really practical advice from the church. And oh. really throughout Lent, this, this is the case. Um, today, God our Father brings us to the beginning of Lent. We pray that in this time of salvation, he will fill us with the Holy Spirit, purify our hearts, and strengthen us in love. That's something I'd like. <laughs> and then some of the prayers are, teach us to be loving, not only in great and exceptional moments, but above all in the ordinary events of the daily day life. Okay, that's something we can start with, work with. Yeah. I mean, your original, well, thank you for letting me be here with you, Catherine Jean Lopez. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, blessed Ash Wednesday to everyone who is viewing this because there are many powerful graces to be had in Lent, even though Lent is probably a dirty word. It is a four-letter word. And um, so I think what, the, what you were pointing to, how people associate Lent with the whole miasma of the pandemic is uh, not unexpected. And it's, it's sort of a natural thing because it did begin in the middle of Lent. And, and Lent is um, dreary. You know, St. John Henry Newman refers, it to, uh, refers to it as the season of humiliation, which is ouch, you know, but, but it is. And man, I don't know about you, but the best things that have happened in my life to make me the person that I'm really destined to be were the fruits of humiliation. But that being said, the dreariness of Lent is not co-equal to uh, what Lent really is. It does not define Lent. I mean, one author speaking about the theology of Lent says it's possible to focus and maybe obsess too much on the theme of sinfulness during Lent, but the church always focuses on the same theme of redemption. So yes, there's sin, but it's not, it's not about the sin. It's about it's about redemption. I mean, even now, in, we're in the darkness and the holy, um, uh, the Easter Vigil fire is about to be lit and all that darkness is meant to be eradicated from us. So to start from the, the certainty that, yeah, even though there's, there's dreariness attached to it, it, it does not go on forever. The resurrection is real. The tomb is empty. It's turned into a linen closet on Easter, and that's the, that's the ordinary, the, the normal, regular way that life is meant to be regarded. Start with that. Well, I was kind of gobsmacked this morning. I, um, I was looking at the words of when I survey this wondrous cross. Yeah. Which I always find amazing. Um, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. And it goes on, but it, the last stanza always hits me the most. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And I just, that, that makes me just so overwhelmingly grateful. Like I could never do enough for this great, unlimited limitless love that was shown to us on the cross each and every one of us that just overwhelms me with gratitude 
And they in that, I see an opportunity in Lent, right? Absolutely. It is overwhelming. And that's why, for example, during Lent, we read a lot from the Gospel of Luke, who has the great merciful parables, like the parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And for Luke, he has a very uh, clear and distinctive understanding and definition of repentance, which is what, what that beautiful hymn is really pointing to, that in the, front, in, in the face of such awesome uh, uh, divine love outpoured with, uh, in such an extravagant, lavish way, uh, we need to be repentant so that we can receive this love. And so for Luke, his definition of repentance isn't about rules and laws and, and commandments and things like that, but for him, it's very simply the acceptance of being found, like the lost son, like the lost sheep, like the lost coin. And sometimes it's the hardest thing. And that's why when we talk about mortification during Lent, I mean, we give up things and you know, all that stuff. And yeah, we have to do that. And I give up a bunch of things. And I need to do it. But the mortification is really about changing our minds, changing the way that we value things, how we appreciate the world around us. Do we appreciate reality in a realistic way? And if we do, then the first impulse that we're going to have is to be mindful of this love that is constantly coming out to find us and to, to, to beg for us. And to accept that love, to receive that love. But as I say, it's an act of mortification because we feel so unworthy, we feel so lost, we feel so fearful, we feel so inept before it. And yet that's precisely the way that the love wants us. It wants us just the way we are right now. I was reading um, a, another Dominican priest homily from this morning and uh, he was talking about sin and he said, and it reminded me of a conversation we had recently. Um, in every sin that we commit, we tell a lie to ourselves. We make a judgment that something we know otherwise to be evil is in this moment, in these circumstances, and by my choosing, good. Uh, he goes on to say, Lent provides us an entire season to confront not only the things that tempt us, but also the loves we harbor that prompt us to lie to ourselves about what tempts us. Are we tempted to sloth? Then what is it about sloth that we love? Are we tempted to impurity? Then what is it about impurity we love? Are we tempted to anger? Then what is it about anger that we love? This We don't think of sin in terms of like, I really love this. That's That, that kind of rocks your world a little bit. <laughs> It does, because when it's put in the context, uh, in the framework of love, then it uh, really exposes it for the, the fraudulent thing that it is. Because, I mean, it's true, and St. Thomas says this, that, that everything that the human heart, the human will goes after, it goes after because of a kind of love, even if it's not a well-reasoned love, even if it's not one we haven't figured out or thought through. But and that's why we use love in so many different ways. You know, we love lasagna. We love to go to the beach, but we also love our parents. You know, we, we love our spouse. We don't love them all in the same way, but there's, there's something of that. Yeah. There, there's, there's something of that, that kind of joy and that, that um, belongingness that is part of every act of loving. And, but when we see that that is also part of our whole um what, uh, uh, what uh, struggle with sin, we're scandalized by that because, yeah, I don't, I don't want to love something that makes it impossible for me to be free, possible for me to be myself, that can't in any way contribute a good to other, never mind to God, and that is by definition injurious of myself and of my destiny. So what do we do if we realize, oh, okay, so my, you know, my sin is, my, my, you know, predominant sin is maybe anger. And I think a lot of Americans could relate to that. You know, I love anger. I mean, no, I don't want to love anger. but I find myself angry. What do I do? Well, for every, every, Every sin, I think, maybe it's not true to say this, but it's certainly true of anger. I mean, there is, there is an aspect of anger that is 
that is not only justified, but it's virtuous. So St. Thomas says that the virtuous element of anger is, is that it prompts us to combat sin and to, and to uh, mm-hmm. stand up to injustice. And we need that, you know? I mean, right now in the world, which is being ravaged by this war in Ukraine, the, the, there's, there's a lot of justified anger being shown and thank God for it because otherwise the evils that are being perpetrated will, will just mow down more people than, than they already are. So, but to reckon, but very often, the, as Simon Weig says, sin is, is an attempt to fly to escape from my, my, to fly away from my emptiness. So there's a lot of sin that we sort of just um, lapse into because it provides a way of getting by in life for the f- next five minutes and then for the five minutes after that, et cetera. And then unfortunately, if I live an unexamined life, then I don't realize that my anger has turned me into an angry person. But I don't know, even though we love our sins, we're even in love with our sins. I don't know anybody that is wants to admit to the world that they're angry, that they're jealous, that they're resentful, that they're lustful. They don't. And but if I don't have a way out, if, don't, if somebody doesn't show me that there's a possibility for an escape, I mean, Monsignor Luigi Giussani used to speak about salvation in a way that I've never been able, never able to forget. He says, salvation is an escape from my own inability. If I'm not offered that kind of salvation, then all I have is what is within my own grasp. And those are vices, that that is to say, things that lead to sin. So it begins with, first of all, examining my life, acknowledging the fact that I don't want to be this way. And then just listening to the very first words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John. He says to those disciples who come looking for him, he says to them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? In other words, to let, especially Lent be a, a time when we hear the, the Lord really speaking to our hearts and asking, what do you desire out of life? Are you content with the life that you've been able to manage, one that is ransacked by anger and lust and greed and resentment or and jealousy, or would you like something else, something more, because it's real and it's possible and it's meant for you? I fear a lot of people um, kind of white knuckle through life, you know, Um, which, which is why we get these bad habits that sort of make it possible to go Mm -hmm. on, right? Yeah. Uh, Lent is the time to face those and get rid of them. Pope Francis this morning, um, he, he wasn't able to be at the mass, but his homily was read. And he said um, that fasting is not a diet. It sets us free from the self-centered and obsessive quest of physical fitness in order to help us to keep in shape, not only our bodies, but our spirit as well. Fasting makes us appreciate things for their true worth. It reminds us in a concrete way that life must not be made dependent upon the fleeting landscape of the present world. Nor should fasting be restricted to food alone, especially in Lent, we should fast from anything that can create in us any kind of addiction. This is something each of us should reflect on so as to fast in a way that will, leave, will, will have an effect on our actual lives. So it's more than giving up chocolate. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's very beautiful. And for myself, getting ready for Lent, I thought in prayer, I, I just mused and thought, okay, well, what is it that I really need to be giving myself to, to make sure that I, I spend this Lent in a truly holy way? And I came up with three things. The first is Jesus himself. I want to be thinking about him and fo- be focused on him, praying to him, loving him, be responding to him in a very personal way. I don't want to reduce Jesus to his message. I don't want to reduce Jesus to just some teaching And I don't want to rely on sentimental thoughts I've had about Jesus in the past. I want to know him and I want to know him better. And I want to know him in a personal way and the the way that I would grow in friendship with a friend. I also want Lent to be a time of of really uh, um, unfettered love. So I want to I want to receive love and I want to be a loving person in every possible 
way. And also, it needs to be a time, Lent needs to be a time of community in which belonging becomes the priority in my life that it really is meant to be, because that that is just uh, identical with what it means to be human, but it's something that we lose sight of. And when we've been forced to isolate for months and months and months, for whatever reason, of course, we're going to lose track of that. But I think the fasting part of it links into that because remember the, the reason why we talk about the 40 days of Lent, which are kind of almost impossible to actually, uh, you know, count because of various differences in um, the literature, but anyway, the 40 days of Lent are meant to be uh, living with Jesus the 40 days in the desert when he's fasting. So, and this is nothing but an occasion for him to really experience his love for the Father in the way that he could not have if he were not in that isolation and if he were not um, starving and if his whole life wasn't a life of prayer during those days. So, um, but what's the first thing that Jesus does when he emerges from the, from, the, from the desert? It's that he goes out and he calls his disciples. That what happened in the desert now continues through the community that he has with these apostles that he calls to himself. So I think that's a big part of fasting too. It's, it's to make us recognize that I depend on other people, even just for, my, for, for to be alive. And that dependence is something that I really want to cultivate in a holy and sacred way during Lent. And it's so easy to do just by reaching out to others in need and being the best friend that I can to the people who are my friends. And it's, it's really about making, you know, we, we profess to be Christians. And, um, <laughs> but what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis leaves something to be desired. I think I can say for every single one of us. And yeah. um, this, this is really an opportunity to consciously be thinking about the fact if you're a baptized Christian, you have the indwelling presence of the Trinity within you. That's unbelievably awesome <laughs> you know and of course you know, it's it fam famously I know you don't but but um if I had a dollar for every priest who said on Trinity Sunday that it's a mystery and just left it at that <laughs> I would uh yeah I'd be giving uh making sure the Sisters of Life and many other charities never had to ask for money ever again <laughs> um how, how do we live that more intentionally, to use the word everyone uses? Well, it's so interesting because this is the very mystery that Lent itself points to in the church's liturgy. I mean, the collect, I forget exactly what it says, I don't have it in front of me, you might, but it, but it's, it, it begs for the assistance and the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit. It's like, no, we're starting Lent. This is not Pentecost. What's going on here? But you no, know, the recognition that Yes, what we're doing is awesome, and it's outrageous, and it's momentous, and it's beyond us. And yeah, it is, but we don't have to be concerned because the Holy Spirit is the one who is leading us through this journey. And it is a journey, you know, the, the 40 days of, of Lent are taking us from one place of, of, of relationship with God to a, a, a much more radiant and 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 holy one by by the end and that's not because we've managed to give up chocolate and you know we're gritting our teeth and 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 following all these penitential practices but because we have really opened ourselves as the blessed mother will do in just a few days at the end of march and the annunciation to the influx of the holy spirit to his his living presence which the, the, the Holy Spirit always makes Jesus present in our life. That's his mission. And that begins in a very powerful way as we set out for Lent. And as we continue, it, that only increases. But it means being very mindful of that and praying for the Holy Spirit to be close to us. And, and, and to remind him that we are very weak before this, this, uh, this, this formidable task that to get ourselves ready to be with, with Christ and his passion. And we can only do it if the Holy Spirit is there to accompany us. And 
we can really, really live lives where we're guided by the Holy Spirit, which is so much better than trying to do it ourselves. And the collect on Ash Wednesday was grant, O oh Lord, that we may begin with holy fasting, this campaign of Christian service, so that as we take up battle against spiritual evils, we may be armed with weapons of self-restraint through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, the campaign. It's a it's a campaign. It's it's uh the church at times uses battle imagery to talk about growth in the spiritual life, but there's something to it because the biggest battle ha is happening inside us. You know, right. the biggest battle is between what I think and what I feel and what my lower passions and appetites are urging me to do. And what I know is really is, is the truth is the very task that I need to live by. And I can't face that battle alone. And, it, and it's, it's being held in the embrace of the Holy Spirit that gives me the confidence to be able to sort out all those things and to be a person of peace, which is one of the chief gifts and marks of the work of the Holy Spirit alive in a soul. I hate to say this because it's important to say, speak out against a Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it's far easier for us to say that and to get upset and watch the news than to actually do what we can concretely do, those of us who are not leading countries <laughs> to, to affect this situation. And that is prayer and fasting. And I was really moved uh, by another thing that Pope Francis had in his homily. He said, prayer, charity, and fasting need to grow in secret, but that is not true of their effects. Prayer, charity, and fasting are not medicines meant only for ourselves, but for everyone. They can change history. First, because those who experience their effects are almost unconsciously pass them on to others, but above all, because prayer, charity, and fasting are the principal ways for God to intervene in our lives and in the world. They are weapons of the spirit. And with them, on this day of prayer and fasting for Ukraine, we implore from God that peace, which men and women are incapable of building themselves. That's amazing. Yes, the whole notion that we're stepping into something that is impossible and and we're doing it with full volition and, and full uh, freedom and intentionality. It's the most daring thing. It's the, it's, the most, it's the riskiest thing, but it's the most realistic thing because I don't know about you, but for me, all of my Lent is about one thing. I want to, by the end of Lent, to be able to stand at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with St. John, with Blessed St. Mary Magdalene, and not with the people that are calling for Jesus to be crucified. And I certainly don't want to be one of those who is too, too cowardly to the point of fleeing from that place so that they, they don't even show up. But it's a, it's a mammoth thing even to desire and almost presumptuous to, to, to think that, yes, it, it can be accomplished in my life, but the church and, and the Lord working through the church wouldn't give us the season, which is all about that campaign for uh, heroic holiness, if it were not possible to accomplish. One of your favorites, Blessed Henry Suso, says arise time is passing the lord whom you have so often driven away will not leave you it is not good for a person to refuse entrance from a friend for too long unlock your heart give admittance to your beloved make amends for all the time you have wasted he who opens late to his beloved ought to do so with eagerness and haste your condition is not that of many other people who are lukewarm in love neither God nor the world, and love neither God nor the world. God wants every inch of your loving heart as completely as the world formerly possessed it. Therefore, apply all your energies and affections, which you've devoted formerly to temporal interests, to eternal matters. So much of our days are about temporal interests, aren't they? 
They are. And that, that line about making amends, I think that's, that's very timely and, and sort of prophetic. I was talking to a friend yesterday who's going through a rough time uh, as a result of many things, but she is reading a book for Lent that I think has the title of something along the lines of a, a time for mending. I thought, you know, that's a very beautiful way of thinking about Lent. So yeah, it's a time for making amends, but it's also a time of mending. And even though what, what is put before us is momentous and formidable, it is a season of humiliation. It's, it's also a season of humility. It's a time to come before the Lord and simply to confess to him our weakness, our limitation, our imperfection, our inability, our frailty, our fragility, our actual defects, but all in a spirit of great confidence, because as much as we want to make amends, Jesus wants to mend us of the things that really are broken or severed or, or, or undone or need to be sewn up, and he will. And that's why it's 40 days. I mean, they go by very fast, I find, even though the fast days are rough, you know, you can't, can't wait for the, the next morning to come, but still it goes by very fast, even to the point where it's like, oh, I don't want to be over yet, over to be over yet, because I, I finally got into a, a kind of a routine of, of, of loving God more and of, and of, and of uh, dispossessing myself of the false self and of, of setting my heart really on, on the things that matter, which are, I mean, other people and being other directed, et cetera. So, but to, to, to be little in terms of, of approaching our Lent, that we need to be mended and the one who's going to be risen from the tomb is even now saving and redeeming us in precisely the way that he knows we need it. And it's always uh, so striking to me that when we're not purposely, you know, during Lent or Advent, thinking about people who are struggling, we can assume that people aren't struggling, <laughs> you know, everyone's struggling with something. Oh, and no. so it's not just about, you know, giving alms is not just about going to the homeless shelter. It's, it's about really looking the people, you know, in the eye, maybe coworkers who you take for granted or, you know, people you see every day, but you know, nothing about their lives. You know, um, we have so many transactional relationships and we, we don't do it intentionally or maliciously, I think most of the time, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's not Christian. It's not the way Jesus treats us. Yes, which is why so many of the beautiful readings in Lent are about how Jesus looks at us and that gaze of love that really just sets everything into the order that it's meant to be. I mean, that's, what's, that's what we, we lose sight of, that, that gaze of love. And, and when it's on us, that yeah, we do want to look at everyone in our life in a new way, certainly in a merciful way, and even a, a, an expressly for, for, forgiving way. But, but what you say about the fact that everybody struggles, it is really true. And if there are any good things that have come from the pandemic and, and the whole experience of the last 18 months, it's that we've recognized that there, there aren't any uh, sort of uh, bionic people out there, that everybody struggles and, and having sort of just sort of a predisposition to be sensitive to the struggling of people is itself an act of mercy that is freeing for them, but also freeing for us. Uh, and, and the real strength that is given to us as Christians, which is to be people of tenderness and of mercy and of forgiveness and of grace, uh, really happens more, more readily, even if we're not actually talking about religion when, when we encounter them. Just, it's, right. it, it, just that, that special way of looking at people. Yeah, and appreciating that everyone is a creature. Everyone's created by God. And, yep. um, and so they have this um, inherent dignity that we need to respect and, and even reverence. And I, I sometimes get in trouble in a political context, but like people we disagree with, 
people who do unbelievably terrible things to us, they're created by God. And so, you know, I, I confess, I didn't cheer when Osama bin Laden was killed. I, I wept that someone gave his life for such terrible things, you know, this, uh, this, it's a tragedy, you know, um, and we have to pray. One of the most beautiful things um, I, I've ever heard I think we lost. I think we lost Catherine. Catherine. Um, if everyone wants to just sit tight for a minute, uh, let's see. Oh, there she is. Great. <laughs> and and we've got you muted now, Catherine. So unmute. So sorry about that Wait. technical difficulty. We're all used to that, right? <laughs> I don't know where I was lost, but I, I was talking about the importance of loving our enemies, right? Um, a young woman during the ISIS genocide from Iraq uh, talked at World Youth Day about how uh, she she had multiple members of her family killed by by ISIS, and so she hated ISIS. But she was praying one day, and uh, she really strongly felt that Jesus was telling her to pray for ISIS. So the Divine Mercy Chaplet, which is uh, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. She felt inspired to pray as for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on ISIS and all the whole world. And she had such a hard time praying it, <laughs> um, but she knew it was important. And if nobody prays for these people, then nothing is going to change. It goes back to what Pope Francis said about the power of prayer. Yeah. And one of my great uh, spiritual heroes is a spiritual writer who is just not that well known. His name is Father Basil Maturin. Uh, he actually died on the Lusitania when it was sunk. And he was a convert to the faith. And he, some of his books have been reprinted, but he has absolutely breathtaking meditations on the seven last words. And I was reading, I started to read them today. Uh, I'm going to try to really reflect on them during Lent. But in, in, in the first, um, in the first uh, word, he really reflects on the contempt that Jesus Christ was shown on the cross. And then he says, well, it was, it was ungodly, literally. But he said, now we have never come close to that. And yet how we get upset by the least little infraction or some violation of our dignity, et cetera. And, and it, of course, you know, that's our justice kicking in, but Jesus on the cross is showing us something even greater than justice, the perfection of justice, which is that, something that comes not through a doctrine, but through the laying down of his life and sacrifice. And it's the sacrifice of which we partake in the Holy Eucharist. But, for that to be sort of the the um, what the the go to for when we we do get done in by I don't know just feeling that we're overlooked or unappreciated or that people actually show contempt to us that there is a great good that is to come from it if we live by a truth that's greater than just uh, how bad those experiences make us feel and angry they make us feel. That is the injustices. We weren't promised that they would be alleviated. The, no. the things that hurt us, uh, Jesus didn't say that you would live a life where you're not hurt by people. Um, but when we get hurt and when things don't work the way that they should, we do get upset. And mm -hmm. um, it, it's so liberating to look at Jesus on the cross and see what, we've done what to him by our sins and that's why we need all of this lent because little by little jesus takes us into the paths of righteousness and away from our own way of of looking at life and reality remember the probably the chief effect of original sin is the human being's attempt to redefine everything according to his, to the human being's own measure, to remake man in man's own image. 
and it goes deep. And, and Lent is really all about what happens in that garden. And, and it's about the fall and it's about the return to paradise. This is what the, the, what the, the good thief on the cross begs for as he looks at this man who is as brutalized as he is, which is what gives him probably the courage to ask for this outrageous thing. Let me be with you this day in paradise. So we're asking for that, even though we're not, we're, we're all thieves and we want to be good thieves, but we're, we want to start asking for that paradise right now because the paradise that Jesus gives us is the right way of looking at our life and to be able to deal with injustice, to be able to deal with actual um, persecution and being hated and, and being shunned. And, and through all of that, not to collapse into self-pity, but to recognize that the, the, the very strength and grace that enables Jesus Christ to carry the cross and to lay down his life to the Father and for the Father is being given to us as well. And changing us, changing the way that we think and, 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 and value life. And it's, as you said earlier, this interior work makes all the difference in the way that we interact with other people. You know, the, it goes back to that, the G.K. Chesterton, what's, what's wrong with the world? Me, you know, if I were right. making decisions differently, the world would look different you know? yes. why why is it important to you um to, to take up some of these devotions like the stations of the cross well human beings are creatures of habits and so if we've gotten into a routine or a way of doing things a habit that is not leading us to our our real fulfillment so, so much of the struggle and the pain, the real suffering that many people undergo, but especially young people, especially young people, is this sense that life has no meaning, that life has no purpose, and that I have no place here. And if that is the case, then, then why persevere? Why deal with so much sadness and heartbreak and treachery and betrayal and just the inability to find anything that... Uh, gives me a sense of thriving and of, and of just a of real joy. If, if I can't find that, even for five minutes, it's very difficult to, to press on. But very often, the reason why some of those um, feelings arise in our life is because we've adopted habits that only lead us into a greater sense of, of, of darkness and of, and of sort of being paralyzed or being I don't know the word to use, but put in a place where um, where thriving just is is not possible. And so, the only way that where they feel feel like they're suffocated. Suffocation, yeah, there it is. That's it, Catherine. Yeah, okay. suffocation. But the only way to overcome a bad habit, it's you can't just like leave it off. You have we have to actually begin to exercise new habits. And that's what these devotions do for us. They, they are ways of sort of a re-energizing or, or what do you do with a car battery? I mean, we want to do that with our soul. And so, yes, we, 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 we pray the Stations of the Cross, which are so beautiful because they're so visual and they're so vivid. So here are the acts of Jesus Christ loving us. And for me, it's especially when the Lord is stripped and he stands before us naked. And that's the one thing we all, I mean, I'm speaking about me, but I think we all have a problem with being vulnerable like that before the world. But he's saying, no, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I'm actually going to be nailed. I mean, Christ, who, who spends his whole life moving everywhere he can to be involved with everyone's life, now becomes immobile. And it's, it's scandalous to the point of, you know, just of tears. That Christ, never mind the pain, but the, the fact that he, he lets himself become like this stationary object. So the point is, we need these devotion devotions to create habits of holiness in us that orient our minds and our hearts to God and to godly things, so that whether we are aware of it or not, we become godly by virtue of those habits that, that become one with us. 
Well, and you talked about earlier the gaze, and um, I was talking to um, Sister Faustina from the Sisters of Life who wrote the Litany of Trust Prayer and oh, has a, a Litany of Trust repeat, Retreat book that's actually out now. And um, I was asking her for, for Lent advice, and she said um, that, that one Lent, what, one of the things that she did was uh, took the Divine Mercy image and um, looked at Jesus's face looking at her for five minutes every day. Wow. And you know, the first day, it's, it's kind of awkward, you know? How am I gonna do this for five minutes? But she had the most beautiful experiences encountering that gaze. Um, one of my favorite stations is Veronica, you know? Um, and, and, and often, I, I always go to that station. I mean, I try to go to all the stations when I, whenever I go to a new church. And so often the way the artist depicts it is so beautiful. Um, him looking at her, her in his pain, her looking at him with such love. Um, just, yeah, um, that, that, or, or if you have a crucifix, you know, looking, looking at Jesus on the crucifix, looking down at you, he died for you, every single one of us. That's unbelievably beautiful, you know? I love the idea of looking at the holy face. And, and so here's a, here's a, um, an insider Lenten tip. You know what you do is you make that face of Jesus. This, you're talking about the face of, uh, of the divine mercy image is that the one that sister looks at yeah, so whatever yeah. face it is I, I like the face of the shroud you mm -hmm. make that the wallpaper on your iphone during lent and then when you're looking at your phone people think that you're doing you know oh, you're, really? you're texting and stuff you're not you're praying you're letting yourself be caught up in the gaze i have that on my ipad oh yeah oh yeah. that's awesome <laughs> well there there's so Almost every Good Friday, except I guess the one where we weren't in church, um, I I'm at mass or it's not mass on Friday, Good Friday. I'm 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 at church on Good Friday, and I hear "O oh, Sacred Head Surrounded" by yes. Crown of Piercing Thorn, and mm. every word of it is just so beautiful and draws you yeah. into this truth. And I think, could we not play Lord throughout these forty days and just listen to this? every single day you know and you can you don't have to go to church you can re just read the read the words or listen to to someone singing it um what's it's so visual and it's so true what's your favorite it's, your, it's your favorite no what's the favorite oh yeah i love it but what are, what are the favorite lines that stand out to you in this your bitter passion good shepherd think of me with your most sweet compassion, unworthy though I be, beneath your cross abiding, for every would I rest, forever would I rest, in your dear love confiding, and with your presence blessed. I mean, that's, isn't, I mean, the, that's, that's How the ultimate How could Jesus prayer. say no to that? Do you know what I mean? If you but start your Lent. He say yes? <laughs> and yet and he know, does. What's the coolest thing about that? I mean, it's it's extremely beautiful. It's moving me to tears. And so there's many beautiful things about it. But do you really think that Jesus, as he's dying on the cross, that anyone is going to remember that he's the good shepherd? And if you remind him of right. that, oh my gosh, that's going to pierce his heart in a way that doesn't hurt, except, you know, and with the, the, the pain of joy. It's like, because what that, that verse says is, to Jesus, Jesus saying, oh, you know, you know I'm your good shepherd. You know it. Because here's the thing. On Good Friday, we all want to console Jesus Christ on the cross. How do we do it? And we think with our emotions, with our sentimentality, with uh, promising that we're going to change our life. No, none of that has nothing to do with what consoles him. There's only one thing that consoles Jesus Christ. And what is that? Letting him console us. That's the only thing that consoles him. His whole life is about giving his life away, even as he's dying on the cross, even as he's having his life ripped out of him. He still wants to give his life away to anyone that stands beneath his cross like this. Uh, Forever would I rest in your dear confining in your, I, I, I missed the line, and with your presence blessed, but beneath your cross abiding and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I know that what is happening right now, you're dying on the cross, is not in vain because I need the blood that is pouring from your sacred wounds 
to heal me of my sins. And I know that I am not worthy of one drop of that blood, but that you want to give it to me. That consoles him, you know, because then he knows he doesn't die in vain. And this hymn is really a, a, an enconium to that fact, that, that, mm -hmm. that truth. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, and that's why this goes back to the point about humiliation. We actually... Want to be humiliated during Lent because that's the reality it brings us closer to, it unites us to without God. So yeah. many of the are are such reminders of who that uh, um, reading for Christmas and and there that is throughout the the liturgy um, on Holy Thursday where true charity is dwelling, God is present there, and meditating on that. Yeah, and, and I, I don't want to make too much of or, or, or give the wrong cast to the season of humiliation notion because there, you know, there are Jansenists and people like that who are like reveling in the fact that it's a time of humiliation. But oh. it's, it's not humiliation that is meant in any way to, to be, uh, to rob us, rape us of our, of our dignity, but rather to woo us back to our dignity in, in the way that it needs to happen because every, every, every virtue and every grace is, and, and, and every good thing that God gives us is possible only because of a predisposition of humility. And as Pope St. Francis, uh, St. Francis says, you can't have humility without humiliation. So it, it's, it's that, but it, it's, it's not, Again, it's not leading to 40 days of just grim, sort of dire, terrible, sort of miasmic, abysmal living. It's not that. It's because it, Lent is joyful. And we even have a, a the third Sunday is Gaudete, is Lautari Sunday, where we, we speak about the joy and the joy that's, that's possible from, from finally living in a way that, which is the path of righteousness, in which we've put aside the false self, the pride, the egoism, the narcissism the arrogance and all the self-assertiveness and we've let the good shepherd love us and in the humiliation that comes from that yes we've we've developed these these wonderful uh, virtues of docility and humility i mean i think of, of one important thing to to meditate on in in lent is that it's really a time for overcoming our forgetfulness can i tell a story so there's a, a a priest that uh, I, I lived with once who was transferred very quickly because he was sick and he wasn't able to pack his own belongings. So the people in the house packed his things into bins and they sent him, them to the, the town where he was living to one of these storage units. And when he finally got better, he was able to go to the storage unit and, and open up these bins. And I went with him because it was, we were gonna close down the storage unit. And as he was opening them, he was saying, wow, I forgot that I had this. Look what I have. And there were all these precious, wonderful, valuable, good things that now he could take hold of again and begin to use in his life. Things that were, were, were helpful implements to the living out of his life. Well, Lent is like that. We've forgotten that there are so many wonderful, great things that have been tucked away and stored away and shoved into bins. But Lent is a time for all of those things to be opened up and to say, I forgot to say, no, look at all of this wonderful grace that is for you to be had by you. Because Lent is a time of graces and, and that and you just we need to live in and live memory. We need to live in, in, a, in a mindful way of all that is put before us to make use of it in a way that can, can bring us back to uh, the life that we know that we're all longing to live. When we reach Holy Week, are there some things to look out for in the passion narrative and um, so that we're not just 
going going through the motions? That's a great question because it comes so fast, I think, Catherine. And one of the things we're supposed to give a short homily on on Passion Sunday, which is the first mercy of Easter. But um, (laughs) I usually use it to remind people to live Holy Week in a holy way, like no other week of the year. So decide um, all the different things that you're going to do that week to really sanctify the week. I think something else that's very helpful is to identify with, with certain of the characters, the dramatis personae of Holy Week, and really let them help you, whether it's Mary Magdalene or Simon carrying the cross or, or you know, Pontius Pilate or, or, the, or somebody like Judas Iscariot, because we don't, want to, we don't want to fall into betrayal, but to live it very mindfully in, in, in the accompaniment of, of the people that God gives us in, during Holy Week to, to draw us, as I say, very close to the base of the foot of the cross as a believer and not as someone in the, in the, in the anonymous crowd calling out for Christ's crucifixion. As scandalous as it is to stand there, mm-hmm. we're not scandalized because we've come to recognize the value and the power of suffering. So to identify with those characters, I mean, in the proper sense, you know, those dramatic persons, holy persons who are, um, who, who, who give us their resolve as we stand united in and with the cross of Jesus Christ. Fulton Sheen has that beautiful little book, Characters of the Passion, yes, which is something yes. good to, to read during, during Holy Week. Yes. As you were talking about desiring being at the foot of the cross, when like Peter was running away, right? The first Pope, um, eventually, I, I, I couldn't help things, you know? Um, Desire, holy, holiness, and bold, something I don't think we really can. I, and so... I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, no, go I, ahead, please. Your words, because you got um, faded out. I, I thought that I was just saying, wanting to be at the throne would, would ask us to do, ask for our oldness. It does, it does. But that's that's why it's a season of humiliation, but also a season of boldness. Because if we're willing to suffer the humiliations, God is not going to humiliate us. He's going to take all of that freedom now that has been set free to become risk takers, daring people, people of boldness, and to really accept these these powerful virtues and gifts of the Holy Spirit that transform us. I mean, remember, yes, Peter ran away from the cross, but you turn just a few pages after the Gospels, and there he is in the Acts of the Apostles preaching to beat the band and, and, and converting thousands of people and, and, and really standing as a, a totally fearless, uh, unflappable man of faith. And that's what we are destined to become, too. And there's so much practical advice in the spiritual life in St. Paul. And I think of if Christians are really living Christianity, we have, we'll have more St. Paul's. We can be instruments that God can reach into those people who are persecutors. You know, Um, we can't, we can't demonize these people. We need to pray for them. You know, the point about ISIS again. Yes. So as we set out in Lent, I think it's very important right up front to be very uh, intentional about, Lord, this is going to be a time where I come to grips with the mystery of suffering. I want to be able to suffer well. I want to see the value of suffering. I don't want to waste my suffering. This is a time of hope. No matter how much the world is collapsing around me, I know that you are real and that the good that, that you have put into my life today is meant to be the good that I'm going to live tomorrow. But it means I need courage and perseverance 
endurance and persistence. I need all of those graces to be able to be certain that I can keep my eyes focused on the future in a way that's not optimistic, but it's a way of looking at reality the way that God looks at it. And yeah, and, and to be a person of repentance that because repentance is not to an idea or a law or a rule or some guidelines, it's to a person. And so I want to be good because you are good, God, and I want to be good with your goodness. And that means every shred of attachment to things that hold me back or that actually collapse me into evil, I say no to those things because I know that you would not be calling me to this, 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 this uh, new uh, embrace of love if it were not meant to be the permanent way of my living. And that's where th there's joy in Lent because yeah. this is an opportunity to let God's grace completely transform our lives and yeah. be our, so our entire lives can be an act of love and gratitude for the love that God has given us that we can never fully return. And the second law of thermodynamics says things go from order to disorder. So yes, next year we're going to need Lent again. And there's no shame or scandal in that. We, because to be human is to be becoming. That's what differentiates, differentiates us from angels. Angels don't become. They are what they are. But we're in a constant state of becoming. And that's not a cause for, for, for sadness or depression, but rather for a greater yes to Jesus Christ, like the yes of Our Lady to the angel at the Annunciation, who was more terrified of her than she was of him. Mm. And one of one of our, our mutual friends, Father Donald Haggerty, has a book called Conversion. Yes. And the point of it is so important. We think of the word conversion like it's something that happens, you know, uh, once. It's every single minute of every hour of every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, St. John Henry Newman says, what is conversion? Conversion is simply a deeper discovery of what I already desire. Mm -hmm. And that's why to go back to the first line of our Lord in the Gospel of John, what do you desire? What do you desire? Your conversion is all ordered to that. And if we want conversion for ourselves, and if we want conversion in the lives of the people to whom we minister, we go out in a missionary evangelical way to them, that conversion is only going to happen on the level of desire. Until people really begin to feel what they want in their life and that they don't have it, that there's dissatisfaction. What an awesome gift dissatisfaction is, because it shows us that, okay, I, this, uh, there is satisfaction, but I haven't met it yet. And we're not going to meet it in anything finite or limited or created. It can only be given to us through the infinite love of the one who is himself infinite, who is calling us to that infinite way of loving and of being. And that's what we celebrate when we take up Christ's resurrection on Easter morning. And that's why if anyone is dreading Lent, is thinking, oh my goodness, another Lent, you know, we, we're, we're still dealing with COVID and all the rest. No, this is what frees us. Yes. This is what makes a difference. This is what gets us out of the fear, because there's another reality that is not what we're watching on the news, you know? Yes, they have well, to relent of hating Lent. Relent of hating Lent. Well, with that, very tweetable. You're not on social media, but that's very tweetable, Father. Thank you. <laughs> we are going to have to wrap up. <laughs> and I, so I want to thank everyone who's joined us live or, or after the fact. Please do share this with people who are just looking for, to hear uh, uh, normal people thinking through Lent. You know, um, Thank you uh, so much, Father Peter John Cameron, for, for joining me again. Um, on behalf of the National Review Institute, um, I look forward to further conversations like this. And uh, again, I thank you all. Uh, prayers for your Lent. And I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, this one. God bless. <laughs>